Hey everyone, welcome to Night School. I'm Christina. I'm Arya. And you, uh, well, we are streaming from home, but on behalf of the California Academy of Sciences and Nightlife, which is the Academy's Thursday night program that brings together art and culture and science. Um, and Night School is us bringing a little bit of that to you. So um, tonight we are talking about fungi. And actually tonight, there is an event, nightlife event happening in the building celebrating the Lunar New Year. Um, so happy Lunar New Year, everyone. Um, but last year, there was actually a fungus among us, a fungus <laughs> theme nightlife. Last year, last week, <laughs> a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, weeks ago, anyway. Um, if you're there and here, thank you so much. I don't know if there's like super fans, but um, <laughs> yeah. So before Aria uh, introduces our awesome guest today, I just wanted to mention our little host switch up. Um, depending on how long you've been watching night school, um, this may matter to you, it might not, but um, I, <laughs> I hosted night school until July of last year when I left to go have a baby. Um, Aria Grace gracefully stepped in <laughs> and co-hosted with Lynn. And now Lynn has stepped away to focus on in-person nightlife. So she's in the building right now. So if you do get a chance to go to nightlife, go find Lynn and say hi to her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Aria, would you like to introduce our guests? Absolutely. Yeah, we have, a, as Christina said, really fantastic lineup tonight. Um, we're going to start off with Dr. Kabir Pei, who is the Associate prof pro Professor of Biology at Stanford and is a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. Um, and he's gonna share about how mycorrhizal fungi shape the distribution of trees across the planet. Don't worry about the big word, we'll get into it. Um, <laughs> and uh, how these fungi will play a role in forest resiliency in the face of climate change. Um, and then second, we have Dr. Ade Guzman, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at UC Irvine and is going to share about opportunities to harness these same fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, for healthy soils and plants uh, with in applications to agriculture. Um, and finally, we're going to have Dr. Marcos Cayafa, who is a postdoctoral researcher at UC Riverside, and he'll share about uh, how truffle-eating birds boost the health of their forest homes in uh, certain ways. And yeah, really, really exciting, uh, well-rounded look at fungi underground, literally. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're really excited to have you all. As always, tonight's program is live. So thank you to all of you joining us and telling us where you're from, Tahoe, Ontario, saw someone from Mexico. Um, so yeah, there's a Q&A after each presenter. So drop questions into the chat or comments whenever you have them and we'll get to them um, after each talk. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kabir Pei. Hi everybody. Can you all see me there? Perfect. All right. So yeah, thanks so much for the invitation to be here at night school. I was actually at the Fungus Among Us night last week. So if any of you were there, you might be sick of me, but hopefully hopefully not yet. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, the system that I've been working uh, in for a while. Uh, and also it's really exciting to be here with Ida and Marco, who are two other scientists whose work that I, I really appreciated. And today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, how networks of mycorrhizal fungi uh, help sustain the health of our planet. Whoops, there we go. And so, you know, the title of this talk is Seeing the Fungi for the Trees. And to me, this has uh, two meanings. Um, the first is that, you know, when most people go outside and go hiking, uh, you know, we tend to look up. And this is a picture from a tropical rainforest. And, you know, naturally in a tropical rainforest, looking up is not a bad thing to do because these are amazing trees. And uh, this is where a lot of the charismatic animal life resides. Um, but I tend to want to look down when I'm hiking, and if you ever do go out in a tropical rainforest like this and look down, um, you would see something that looks like this, the forest floor, which is relatively monochrome and might seem somewhat boring by comparison to the canopy. But if you start to look closely, you know, you can occasionally see little splashes of color that break the monotony of this leaf litter. And uh, if you begin to look even more closely at this particular splash, you would see something beautiful, this coral mushroom here. 
And you know, the more you look around the forest floor, the more diversity of shapes and colors you would see poking up out of the forest floor. And you know, for a long time, these mushrooms um, that you'll all recognize here were really the primary clue that we had to this immense diversity of life that is going on beneath our feet. And this is true not just in tropical rainforests, but really in any forest, deserts, uh, or grassland out there. And so while soils might seem relatively inert to us, they're really teeming with life. And uh, you know, a single gram of soil contains billions of bacterial cells, kilometers of fungi, thousands of amoeba, and hundreds of microscopic worms called nematodes. Uh, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, diversity of the life in the subterranean world, focusing on the group of organisms that I love and that hopefully you're all here to hear about, the, the fungi. Uh, and so I just showed you a couple pictures of mushrooms, and while those are beautiful, you know, the mushrooms are really just a small port, part of the story of what fungi are. And so before I go farther into my research, I want to talk a little bit first about what fungi are, since I, in my experience, they're often somewhat misunderstood and underappreciated. And in the broadest sense, fungi are uh, filamentous eukaryotes. So as eukaryotes, they have a nucleus and they belong in the same general neck of the evolutionary woods that we do. But most importantly, the bodies of fungi are made up of these microscopic filaments known as hyphae. Um, you can see two Im images here in my slide. On the left is a human hair. For comparative purposes, on the right is a fungal hyphae, which is about 10 times narrower than the human hair, about 1 200th of a millimeter. Uh, and these filaments grow and extend. You can see it kind of moving forward from the tip of the hypha right here. And because these hyphae are so fine, they can reach incredibly high density in very small spaces. And this allows them to create a huge surface area that lets them grow into solid food like wood or soil and then really efficiently digest and absorb it. And the truly amazing thing about fungi is that these individual filaments can fuse together to create a network, uh, which we collectively call the mycelium of the fungus. And this mycelium gives the uh, fungus the ability to move resources around and really to integrate its behavior across the really uneven resource and environmental landscapes that it might encounter if it was growing in, say, soil or, or wood. All right. Now, because these fungal hyphae are so small and they're often embedded in the things that they're eating, it's not easy to see and study them. So how do we go about uh, studying fungi? Uh, in my lab, uh, we use DNA sequencing uh, to enumerate the different species of fungi that are present in different kinds of environments. And you know, from this sequencing, we're now beginning to have a pretty good sense for the scale of fungal, fungal diversity um, at a range of spatial and temporal scales. And one of the first things we've found from this sequencing is that the local diversity of fungi is very high. And uh, in particular, the magnitude of fungal diversity in soils is quite striking. So in a typical handful of soil from any forest in the world, you, you'd observe, say, a between 100 and 1,000 species of fungi. And uh, this is equivalent to the diversity of trees that you would see in, say, 50 hectares of tropical rainforest. So these are very diverse communities at the, a very small spatial scale. At larger spatial scales, we, we've also learned from this kind of sequencing that fungal communities are relatively uh, distinct regionally in their composition or the membership of the species that are there. So the figure uh, that I'm showing you here is from a study we did comparing the fungal composition in a thousand soil samples taken from across uh, pine forests in North America where we use these DNA sequencing approaches. And these colors show how different or similar the composition of fungi is in these forests. Um, and you can see that these different regional areas have different colors. Uh, you know, for example, the boreal forests in the north are kind of orange and red, and the southeast forests are pink. And this represents the unique fungi that are found in each of these different forest types. And so if in a small handful of soil or plant leaves, uh, you can have somewhere between 100 and 1,000 species of fungi. And since the you know, unique climates and evolutionary history of each region mean that means that each corner of the globe has new and different fungi. If you add that up, it, it, if you add that together, it, it adds up to a lot of fungi. And so some of the most recent estimates of fungal diversity uh, are somewhere around 6.2 million species, uh, which is a lot of species. You know, for a comparison, global plant diversity is somewhere around 390,000 species. And there are probably about 10,000 species of birds and 5,000 species of mammals. So fungi are one of the most diverse taxonomic groups on the planet. Okay, so this might be cool if you just appreciate the sheer variety of life, but if you're more practically minded, uh, you might ask, you know, what does this matter? What, what are all these fungi good for? Uh, 
Uh, and there are a couple of ways to answer this question, but the first is just to say that, you know, all of these fungi have jobs uh, and that their diversity plays a role in how ecosystems work. So, you know, first, um, you know, given that unique body plan that I just talked about with fungi, um, they are some of the greatest decomposers in the world, and they're responsible for the breakdown and continued recycling of the majority of nutrients that are trapped in the dead, uh, dead plant leaves or dead wood. And in doing so, they make these nutrients available again for plants and animals to use. There are also a number of fungi that have decided that they don't want to wait around for plants or animals to die. And so these fungi have evolved to become pathogens that infiltrate and consume living plant or animals. Uh, and this can be problematic for things like human agriculture, but it actually has a benefit in the sense that uh, fungi are thought to contribute to the diversity of plant communities by preferentially attacking common plants and preventing them from outcompeting other species. And so it's thought that fungal pathogens can play a really important role in maintaining the high biodiversity, in particular, of many plant communities. Uh, finally, uh, fungi can be mutualists. And so a lot of fungi have formed cooperative, mutually beneficial partnerships with other organisms. Um, and the colorful splashes of rocks in this picture are like lichens, which are a partnership between fungi and algae. Um, but I want to spend the rest of the time today talking about a particular kind of mutualism called mycorrhizal symbiosis, which is what we study in our lab. So what is mycorrhizal symbiosis? Um, the word comes from Greek, so myco, uh, mycos for fungus and rhiza for root. And so mycorrhiza literally means fungus root. Uh, and the second term symbiosis was originally coined to refer to the intimate living together of unlike things. And so this term refers to a partnership that plants and fungi have evolved where fungi grow into the roots of plants and form this new symbiotic organ that we call a, a mycorrhiza. And the reason that plants and fungi do this is that they're involved in a very beneficial trading relationship where plants give photosynthetically fixed carbon in exchange for critical soil nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus that are generally the things that most limit plant growth along with light and water. Uh, and so some of you might be thinking, you know, how important can this be? These fungi are teeny, these plants are gigantic, but it's actually quite significant. Uh, there was one study I liked that estimated that somewhere close to 90% of the nitrogen in the plant came from mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and some estimates have uh, plants paying about 30% of their net energy income to these fungi. And so you can imagine that uh, something you pay 30% of your net income on is something that you, know, you would value a lot. And one of the coolest things about this is that if you look closely at the roots of plants, and I think um, both Ida and Marcos will talk about this, you notice that the plants have different types of mycorrhizal fungi on them. And the most common one is called arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis. And it's characterized by these, uh, on the left of my slide, these kind of bush-like structures that are actually formed inside the cell of the plant root. Um, and one of the amazing things uh, about this relationship is that it had evolved about 450 million years ago when plants first moved onto the land. And people think that this has been very instrumental in the process of terrestrialization since early land plants didn't really have true roots and weren't good at getting nutrients out of soil. And you can see here, this is a fossil that's 400 million years old and has a very identical bush-like structure from the uh, rhizome of an ancient plant. Since the evolution of this ancest ancestral symbiosis, plants have continued to evolve new ways of doing these kinds of mycorrhizal partnerships. And about 150 million years ago, a, a new form of symbiosis evolved, uh, which is called ectomycorrhizal symbiosis. Ecto means outside because these fungi create a sheath of hyphae that totally covers the finest roots of the plants. And you can see that here on the bottom picture on the left, those are all pine roots. They look like little peace signs uh, and they're totally covered in uh, this white fungal mycelium. Uh, so they're kind of like socks for the, for the uh, plant roots. Uh, and they grow out of the soil and they forage for nutrients. Um, and if you were to take a cross section of, the, of that root, um, you would see that these fungal hyphae totally encase the root and in, in fact grow into the first few cell layers of the plant. And these associations are really diverse. So an individual plant can associate with dozens to hundreds of species of fungi. Uh, and this kind of brings us full circle back to mushrooms. And because a lot of these ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, form mushrooms. And chances are that if you're walking in a forest and you see mushrooms coming out of the ground, they often belong to one of these kinds of fungi. Okay, so what I want to wrap up and talking about is um, how this kind of mycorrhizal symbiosis in large part actually determines the kinds of trees um, that you might see around you if you visit the forest in whatever part of the world that you live in. 
So to try and understand how mycorrhizal fungi shape the distribution of plants, I started a, a really large collaborative project that involved over 200 scientists across the world. And through this collaboration, we were able to get information from uh, uh, 1.2 million individual forest plots where people had gone out and census the tree communities in these plots. And you can see this indicated in the colored dots on this map here. And we went through the 28,000 species of trees that were in this inventory and determined which types of mycorrhizal associations they had, and then calculated how abundant they were uh, in each of these individual plots. From there, we then developed mathematical models that will allow us to predict and explain the relative abundance of different types of mycorrhizal symbioses across these forested biomes. And the forested biomes on this map are shown in, in black. So I won't describe the mathematical model in detail, but what I want to do next is just show you the maps that we generated for the arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal symbiosis. So what you're seeing here is a global map that's displaying the prevalence of these different kinds of cooperative networks that these uh, forests depend on. The, this map here shows the prevalence of this first arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis in, in forest trees. And the colors indicate, indicate relative biomass of these arbuscular mycorrhizal trees with the warm colors showing high abundance and the cool colors showing low abundance. And you can see very clearly that there are these strong latitudinal trends with this AM mutualism being very common in warm, wet places like tropical rainforests, and that they then decline as you move north or south towards the poles. If you switch to seeing the, a map of this ectomycorrhizal mutualism, you see the reverse pattern, right? So these EM uh, fungi and plants can be present in tropics, but they're really generally at their lowest abundance in tropical forests. And they show this opposite latitudinal pattern as the AM uh, symbiosis. So they increase in abundance with latitude, you know, peaking in these cold boreal forests um, in red, where you can see they reach nearly 100% dominance. And, uh, you know, based on the statistical models we, we built, we think that the different patterns we see for these two different kinds of symbiosis are related to the ways in which climate controls the availability of soil nutrients uh, and the relative importance of nitrogen versus phosphorus as being the primary nutrients that limit plant growth. One interesting thing is if you intersect this map with another map of global tree density, uh, we were able to calculate that between these two types of mycorrhizal symbiosis, the ectomycorrhizal and arbuscular mycorrhizal, this actually accounts for 99% of all tree stems on the planet. So 99% of any individual tree that you would see, 99% uh, of all trees uh, form one type of this symbiosis or another. So this is nearly 3 trillion trees. So ho hopefully this brings home this idea that in being involved in mycorrhizal symbiosis is really the rule for plants, not the exception at all. And the other thing you can hopefully see from these is that these there are these very distinct global patterns that show that where trees grow, sort of which types of climates and soil environments we find them in, is largely dependent on the types of mycorrhizal fungi that they associate with. And this is likely going to be important in determining how forests are going to change in the future. Um, so work in our lab and others has shown that these ectomycorrhizal fungi tend to be better at protecting their hosts from fungal pathogens. Um, so these EM trees can often become very dominant um, and may even suppress the local diversity of other tree species. However, studies have also shown that EM trees are better able to respond to the fertilization effects of increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, and that these ectomycorrhizal trees also, and fungi, tend to increase the amount of carbon stored in the soils. And so these EM trees and fungi may actually be uh, very important in buffering us against future climate change by uh, increasing uh, sequestration and storage of, soil, of carbon. Okay, so together, you know, if you look at all these patterns that I just showed you, hopefully they reinforce this idea that cooperation is really critical uh, in nature. And to me, it's really amazing that if you look up at the gigantic trees that you would see in a forest, you know, in the tropics or in the boreal, really anywhere, that you think that these, the kinds of tree species that we're seeing and the overall health and structure of these trees depends really significantly on these tiny fungi that are growing into their roots uh, and the surrounding soil. So, you know, next time if you're, you know, in a forest, uh, it's okay if you look up, even though, you know, you'll see cool stuff if you look down. Regardless, I hope that, you know, when you do, you recognize the imprint uh, of the fungi uh, on the forest that you're seeing around you. Uh, thanks for paying attention, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Hi. Hi, Kavir. Thanks so much. Um, this was great. My mouth was just kind of, like, dropping every so often, like, wow, that's, this is very mind-boggling um, information. <laughs> I'm still processing it, but 
uh yeah anybody out there if you have questions feel free to drop them in in the chat um on facebook and or youtube but to start off um I feel a lot of shame around this question, but is it fungi or fungi? <laughs> like this, this is a recurring <laughs> question that we, yeah. we've been getting. Uh, it, it doesn't. I, both are both are correct. I think uh, with oh. a lot of um, a lot of these things, I think as long as you say it like you mean it, it's okay. So. Cool. Okay, I like that. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, thank you. And um, uh, Lisa. Lisa VS asks, um, what is the smallest unit of fungi, f fungi, I didn't say it like I meant it, um, fungi fiber that can grow slash extend into the soil? Because um, you showed that that one photo, but. Yeah, so I mean, an, an, an individual hypha, which they're often, I say like about five microns in diameter. Um, so an individual fragment could begin to grow um, and expand in the soil. Um, fungal spores are quite small. They're often in the you know, five to 10 micron range as well. So they're quite small. And the spores are really the units that fungi use to propagate themselves and are the things that are produced by say mushrooms. You know, the reason that mushrooms are, appear is because they give rise to spores that then help move the fungi around. Um, and so you know, a very small unit of fungus can begin to propagate a, a very large mycelium. Yeah, oh, very cool. Yeah, I'm kind of going a little rapid fire here because we've, we've got a yeah, lot of no questions. But um, <laughs> David asks, uh, have mycorrhizal relationships in plants other than trees been studied? And, and do we see these like out in nature? Yeah, there. Uh, so most uh, the total estimates, I think, are that uh, so trees may be more mycorrhizal than other plants. But um, the estimates that I've seen are between, you know, 80 percent of plant species. Um, form mycorrhizal symbioses. And so most grasses you would see and most of the small forbs you would see are also forming some kind of a mycorrhizal symbiosis. Um, most of the non, a lot of the non-tree plants will do our muscular mycorrhizal symbiosis. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many, uh, many other plants other than trees that form mycorrhizal symbiosis. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and so, so back to those two different types of mycorrhizal fungi um or fun fungi uh do do both types of them produce mushrooms um or is it just the ectomycorrhizal that we know of it's just the ectomycorrhizal ones that tend to produce mushrooms so the arbuscular mycorrhizal ones mostly just make spores um and those spores are kind of held directly on the hyphae or produced in the plant roots um, so most of them do not make any sort of a macroscopic structure gotcha and so speaking of size like uh, you, you talked about how, you know, we have to study this small thing to understand the bigger trees, but like how, how do we go about protecting and fostering and stewarding biodiversity with, you know, these tiny, tiny things out in the forest? Um, and, and, you know, how, how do forest management practices affect them if, if we have any information on that? Yeah, we're starting to get a lot of information about the kinds of things that can disrupt these networks uh, and negatively impact uh, these fungal communities. So, you know, one thing that's important is pollution, uh, particularly things like nitrogen pollution. Um, you know, because these are economic trading relationships and they depend on the fungi providing some uh, resource of use to the plant. You know, if you heavily fertilize a system, uh, it kind of um, gets rid of the need for the plant to have this mycorrhizal association. So. Things like uh, you know fertilization of agricultural fields or anthropogenic nitrogen deposition uh, can really disrupt uh, these mycorrhizal associations and lead to declines in the abundance of and diversity of these mycorrhizal fungi. Um, we also know that um, kind of intact or large forest systems tend to harbor more diversity, um, and so you know if you're thinking about preserving mycorrhizal diversity, one of the things you can do is preserve um, large intact stretches of forest. Um, and uh, that's another important thing that, that you could work on. Yeah, cool. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially about yeah what you were saying with nitrogen availability and thinking about how that connects back with that map that you showed even. Um, like there are, you know, different types of fungi that work with each type of um, nutrient and, and such. Um, and let me take a look at my, uh, my questions list here. Um, Let's see. Uh, so during drought periods, do mycorrhizae con uh, give more resilience to trees um, in general, or do they ever become like a drain on the 
tree's ability to survive um, is one of the questions that we've we've got from Charles. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work that people have done uh, on what they call this the mutualism parasitism continuum. And so we generally tend to think of these relationships as being mutualisms where both parties benefit. Um, but there is research that if you perturb the environmental conditions, particularly doing things like adding nitrogen, you can actually um, push the relationship into becoming more of a parasitic relationship where the fungus is no longer benefiting the plant. Um, in the case of drought, I'm not aware of studies where people have shown uh, off the top of my head that drought can push it into um, being a parasitic relationship. In fact, if anything, there's probably more evidence that these fungi, I talked about nutrients, but there's lots of other benefits that they can confer to their hosts. Um, and so there are some good studies that show that, you know, these mycorrhizal fungi can translocate water through their hyphae um, and that they're, they tend to be very drought tolerant. And so there's some evidence that um, these fungi may actually be able to help their the plant hosts withstand uh, significant droughts. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're actually interested in, in studying in our lab. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Just such tiny things doing so much. Um, yeah. And let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap us up here with just one more question. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. I'm like trying to decide. There are just so many. Um, so, so revisiting kind of that core, uh, research that, that you showed us, Gina is asking, um, how did you determine that fungi determine the type of trees in, in an area versus the trees determining the type of fungi that will grow? Yeah, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg question there, right? Um, the reason that we think that the, well, so um, there's uh, a lot of other back research that um, kind of supports these kinds of conclusions, but um, I would guess the, I would say the first thing that we know is that these uh, plants do really generally tend to do pretty poorly when they don't have their mycorrhizal fungi. And so they really need um, the, they need these fungi and able to grow well. Um, and you know, the other thing, when you think about causality is that at least for me, um, you know, if it was just a random accident, so that, you know, that certain trees happen to be in certain environments and they have certain kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. And so the trees just are bringing the fungi along with them. Um, that's a possible explanation, but the fact that you see this pattern um, repeated across really different biogeographic regions, and so it happens not just in the Americas, but also in the um, also in you know the Paleotropics and say East Asia and Africa, um, and it doesn't happen just as you go north; it happens also as you go south. And Marcos is going to talk about these. Um, you know, these southern forests that have very different Gondwanan tree species that are evolutionarily very distantly related um, to any other the trees that we would have in the, say, the northern temperate zone, but they're also ectomycorrhizal. And so the fact that independent lineages that inhabit similar climate spaces have the same kinds of mycorrhizal associations is good evidence that this is actually more of a functional relationship that's evolved and needs to adapt to these different kinds of environments rather than just kind of a taxonomic accident that some tree happens to be in some environment. Right. Yeah. That. Wow. <laughs> it's that. Um, that's a really, really great explanation of of how, how just broadly like symbiosis takes, <laughs> you know, years and years. And yeah, that's that's extremely, extremely interesting. But uh, thank you so much, Kabir, uh, for sharing your work and and talking with us. We're gonna bring on Ida next. But yeah, thanks so much. Perfect. My pleasure. Right. Should I just start? Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, it's such a pleasure to go after Kabir, who um, so wonderfully explained how incredible and important fungi are to um, the health of our planet. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the role fungi play in agriculture. And so I work in agriculture, and I think a lot about agriculture. And one of the things that I've uh, thought a lot about is how this intensification of agriculture, uh, basically going from these really diverse types of farms or diverse ecosystems. And I put polyculture here, which I mean, the growing of a bunch of different plants, how this reduction in diversity has resulted in these monocultures that has had a lot of negative impacts on the environment. And Kabir mentions a little bit about increased fertilizer usage, but also uh, the impacts this types of systems have had on greenhouse gas emissions and a bunch of other things. And I've thought a lot about um, 
okay, so if it's impacting, how do we actually make agriculture work for people and the environment? And in my work, I've gone below ground because I think maybe the solution is below ground. And specifically, because if we think about soil as this living ecosystem, we start uncovering some information about how it sustains plants. You know, plants need the nutrients from the soil and fungi, as I'll talk, and animals and also humans. Sorry about the dogs. And, you know, the soil, I really like thinking about this living ecosystem. And specifically, I focus what kind of gets uh, uh, lost in this image are the tiny fungi um, underneath uh, farm soils. And the reason is, is because soil health depends on this fungi. And so we can think about agriculture systems in, in two different ways, and there's usually a, a nuance, but if we think about agriculture systems that think about soils that aren't living, you end up with systems where um, there's fertilizer introduced and this fertilizer like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is taken up by the plants, but then whatever the plant doesn't use usually then gets leached into uh, to the um, leach into the groundwater, which then has a lot of um, negative environmental impacts. On the flip side, agriculture managements that treat soil like a living ecosystem, such as um, putting in compost or cover crops, which is usually a type of planting that you put when uh, your regular crop isn't growing, usually in winter. These types of practices uh, introduce nutrients. And then here's where the microbes come to work, and specifically fungi. So the fungi both help these nutrients that these practices are bringing in become available, you know, by decomposing the plant residue that gets added via compost, but also a nutrient axis such as the mycorrhizal fungi that actually help the plants take up uh, the nutrients. And then these fungi also then use, continue to cycle these nutrients as, as opposed to fully letting them leach out of the system. And in fact, sometimes, these processes lead to sequestering carbon, which could be really important for um, climate change. And so when I think about soils as a living ecosystem, you know, we have all these different uh, organisms and fungi especially, but there's so much happening in the soil that I actually like thinking about it. There's kind of a party happening and there's so much happening on, underground. And so, um, you know, there's a lot happening on the ground, and I've been told that there might be a lag with the questions, but I'll just uh, lay out a question. Uh, so how many meters of fungal filaments, so these hyphae that Kabir was talking about, would you find in one teaspoon of soil? And so is it 10 meters, 100, 1,000, or 10,000 meters? And typically what you would see is um, 1,000 Sorry about that, it got disconnected. Typically what you would find is um, 1,000 um, meters of fungi in a teaspoon of soil, which is a lot if you really think about it. Just a small teaspoon has, one. Th if you stretch all the filaments out, it would be almost a kilometer and sometimes even more than that. And in my work, I've specifically focused on the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And these fungi um, are really important because they provide a lot of benefits, but let's jump into them. So, Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, to really start thinking about them, I always like telling people that you really have to go back 450 million years ago. And that's because the early land plants had this very limited root system. And so they had a hard time actually accessing nitrogen and phosphorus that they needed to grow. And here's where AMF came and helped. So AMF formed, it forms this symbiotic association. So they get into the roots and then they form these hypho networks that then go into the soil and they grab all the nitrogen and phosphorus that the plant needs to grow. And it's such an important symbiosis that there's predicted that over 70% of the land, uh, plants that we find on land form this association with AMF. And then AMF don't actually do this for free. Um, they give nitrogen and phosphorus to the plant, but in return, the plants give carbon uh, or sugars for the AMF. And so in this slide here, what you're seeing is uh, a couple of different uh, structures that are of, uh, of a slide that uh, show the AMF. So here's a stained root from one of the samples I've collected in my work. And you see different structures that represent um, arbuscules. So first are the arbuscules. And these are these tree-like structures, kind of arbuscule like arbol, which actually gives arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi its name. And these little trees go into the root cell and that's where actually the nutrient transfer happens like at the tips of all these different tree-like structures. 
And then there's the vesicles where they get all the carbon that the um, plant is giving them and they store it. And then there's also these hyphae, which you can see these little strands here in the slide that go into the roots and around the roots and then, but they also go into the soil beyond the roots. And I like thinking about this as the transportation system of nutrients. So it's what actually helps get nutrients from the soil into the roots. And so um, one thing I like illustrating about um, the important role of these fungi is to try to think about how far um, these hyphae can actually go into the soil. And so typically, um, you know, uh, plants actually have root hairs where they can take up nutrients, and then they have these fungal hyphae. And actually, when you uh, compare how far these fungal hyphae can go versus the root hairs, fungal hyphae can go 30 times longer than the root hairs. And that's just a reminder that there can be even a thousand meters of these fungal um, filaments or hyphae in one teaspoon of soil. And this is really important, as I've indicated, for nutrient uptake. So if we just if just root hairs were there and they needed to grab the nutrients, they could probably grab some nitrogen and phosphorus really close to the plant, but they probably couldn't reach far enough to grab nitrogen and phosphorus further into the soil. And in contrast, the fungal hyphae go much further and they can actually grab nitrogen and phosphorus that's far into the soil that the plant roots can't reach themselves. But beyond nutrient uptake, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF, provide a bunch of other functions. Um, they can help plants take a, uh, be tolerant to drought. And part of that comes from that they can actually help uh, plants take up water. They can help plants be tolerant to really salty soils or resistance to heavy metals, and even help them uh, fight off uh, pathogens that might come and attack roots, and a bunch of other functions. And so in agriculture, uh, when we think about these AMF, they might be actually really great helpers. And instead of, you know, depending on fertilizers like uh, to bring in nitrogen and phosphorus, these AMF might help, but they might also help in all these other functions. But since not all AMF species are the same, one of the things that's really important in agriculture is how do we increase the diversity of AMF in agriculture soils? And so in my work, I've really focused on that question. What drives the diversity of AMF across agricultural landscapes? And so for that work, I've focused um, mostly here in the Center Valley. And most people, when they think about agriculture in the Center Valley, they just see all these fields that are just giant monocultures. So just one uh, crop growing, usually almonds or tomatoes, et cetera. And I decided to focus my work here to try to find opportunities where we can uh, bring AMF diversity onto farms. And so if you actually drive around and you uh, and look at these farms, you'll actually find really small scale farms surrounded by these monocultures. And these small scale diversified farms or polycultures actually grow a bunch of different crops, like 50 to 100 different types of crop plants. And so I focus on these farms to try to figure out whether these farms might provide an opportunity to bring in more AMF diversity. And so the question has been, you know, what drives AMF diversity? So on, in the system, if we've had just a monoculture of plants growing, just one plant growing at a time, what happens when you go the opposite direction in these systems and the, turn them into polyculture? So instead of just simplifying the landscape, what do we go the opposite direction? And a lot of these farms that are were polycultures or these small diverse private farms used to be these monocultures. So I've been really curious how these farms might affect uh, AMF diversity. But what actually drives AMF diversity across landscapes? Um, you know, one of the options might be the type of plants that are present, um, such as uh, the different crops. But it might actually be the surrounding environment, such as how much nitrogen or phosphorus in the soil. And as Kabir mentioned, sometimes those uh, nutrients might, like especially with fertilizers, might diminish how much uh, the plant wants to give carbon to the AMF. And so maybe that affects the diversity of AMF in soils. It might actually be how far they can go into, um, into the landscape, how far they can move might depend how much, uh, how many AMF species you find in one area. It could be all of it, or you know, it, maybe we don't know. And it's actually kind of a little bit of the last two where we have some information about how these different factors are affecting AMF diversity. But when it comes to agriculture, there's a lot of question about actually how they're affecting. And so here's what we do know about um, AMF diversity across landscapes. When um, say a tractor comes and tills the soil and disturbs it, it can release these AMF spores into the air. And so that's one of the ways that actually AMF can travel across the landscape. 
and then they go across the landscape, they're being moved by the wind, and then they get deposited and they land on soil. Where a lot of the question is, what actually determines which AMF can establish, which different species of AMF can establish when it comes into a soil. And this is really important because through these processes, it might affect how many different AMF or the pool of species of AMF across the whole landscape. And so there's been a couple of different uh, thought, thoughts about how um, what would affect AMF diversity across the landscape. And some of those drivers of what affects AMF diversity across landscapes are, is it the plant host? So is it which crops are being planted? Is it the habitat? So the, where it's at? And is it dispersal? How far they can move, as I mentioned. And so in my work, I've sought out to test this specifically and uh, by looking at how crop diversity affects AMF, the soil environment, by looking at these different variables in the soil, and then also how AMF are moving across geographic distances in an agricultural landscape. And so in the next couple of slides, you'll see some of the results I've seen and some animations in the middle of the screen. And so you'll see farms that are a monoculture here and then this polyculture uh, type of farms here. And then here's these AMF spores um, that are coming to land onto the farms. And so first, when you look at the crop diversity, so you know when you just have a, a one group of uh, plants there versus a, a bunch of different plants, what we find is that there's tons more AMF species on a polyculture farm than in, in a monoculture. And in this particular region, this is really important or really fascinating because these polyculture farms used to be monoculture. So it means that if you, if you can bring and in, introduce a lot of plant diversity, then you might actually increase the AMF diversity in the farms, even though they used to be monocultures in the past. And then if we look at the soil environments, so okay, how is so what how does this change across the soil environment? And so we grouped all these different, uh, different soil environmental variables and put them into an index and then looked at how the diversity of AMF changes across this. And we find that AMF diversity does change across the soil environment, but generally, despite those changes in the soil environment and despite how AMF diversity changes across the soil environmental uh, gradient, AMF species are even more still diverse on polyculture farms. So as you can see here, the soil environment gradient changes, but the AMF species are less diverse on a monoculture and more diverse on a polyculture farm. And so what about um, how they're moving across the landscape? And so then we decided to look at the diversity of AMF across increasing distances of, uh, between farms. And here's what we find. Um, and so I'm gonna explain what these trends mean. Um, so if we consider, uh, if we break this image up and we consider each little wedge a different farm, so one, three farms, and then we look at these farms are actually increasing this. And so this farm is further than this one. What these trends are telling us is that on monocultures, yes, it changes, the difference in the community changes, but then over time, it doesn't change very much. And so it's you know not that diverse um, across distances. But on polyculture farm, the, the differences in the AMF can keep, continue to change as even as you go further into the landscape. And then, okay, um, we're seeing these effects on the farm, but then the bigger question is how does this help the whole landscape of AMF, the, the landscape of AMF that we find, um, or the AMF species that we find in the entire landscape? So instead of uh, looking in the farm soil, what is the contribution of these different farm types to the overall different AMF species that then can go and travel into the agriculture landscape? So here you see a Venn diagram, and the yellow will be the monoculture, and then the Greenish will be the polyculture. In the middle, you'll see um, uh, the overlap. And you'll see the numbers of uh, unique species that monoculture farms provide to the overall pool of AMF. And then those that the polycultures provide um, to uh, the overall pool. And here's where we find that polyculture farms provide way more different types of unique species than the monocultures. If you look at these numbers four times, yes, there's a lot of overlap in between the ones that they provide, but generally they're contributing a, a great number of species, uh, AMF species. And so if we take all this information together um, through this work I've done, we can come back to this question about what drives AMF diversity across landscape and try to put the puzzle piece together. So as I mentioned, there's some information about how AMF are moving across the landscape and then they come and they get deposited onto farms. 
And here's what might be happening. So the pool of AMF, so what's traveling in the landscape, lands on these farms. And then it goes through a bunch of filters. It, it, you know, it depends on uh, specifically the crop hosts that are there and in the soil environment. And on the other end, you end up with this community of AMF that gets established on these farms. And then eventually this goes into the whole pool. And through these processes, we find that polycultures provide the most positive benefits um, in terms of AMF diversity in the landscape, both in the farm in terms of what uh, gets established, but also eventually what gets contributed to the regional pool. And so in the beginning, I uh, through this project, I've been really curious, like what drives the AMF diversity across landscapes, especially when we think about agriculture and the impacts it's had on um, the health of soils, the health of plants. Through this work, one thing that I've I come back to a lot is um, this agricultural landscape that we see here. And what's really important to actually get more AMF species onto an agricultural landscape, it really depends on the diversity of the landscape, specifically the plant diversity at different scales, both on the farms and across. And so to really capture this AMF diversity on agriculture soils, we really have to look at plants. And this is kind of the opposite of what Kabir said, where um, mycorrhizal fungi are driving plants. And in agriculture, I think it's the opposite, where plant diversity might drive what's actually happening below ground in terms of the diversity of AMF we find in agriculture soils. And so um, through this work, you know, it's been really interesting to see how there could be some opportunities to find um, more AMF species in agriculture systems. And so with that, thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Aide. Um, first of all, your slides are beautiful. So Thanks. thank you. <laughs> um, okay, um, so let's see. Um, so a question, I mean, so is there any, like if you, <laughs> If you had it your way, what what types of what can monoculture farms like contribute, if anything? Like, is there any reason for them to exist in terms of like the health of AMF and soil diversity? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and in my work, I you know one thing. I guess to answer the question, we have to look at what polycultures are providing, and I think it's plant diversity at different scales. So monocultures, um, you can have large like uh, acreage and space of just monocultures. And I think one way monocultures uh, can help AMF is by introducing diversity onto, plant diversity onto the farm. So hmm. one of the things that has been really helpful for bees and potentially could be helpful for AMF are hedgerows. So floral plantings are on the edges of fields and that increases plant diversity. And so I think, um, you know, it's not a lost cause with monocultures, but it's mm -hmm. uh, like radically rethinking what monocultures can provide in terms of uh, perhaps increasing plant diversity, not necessarily in the types of crops, but mm -hmm. perhaps what's surrounding. And there's been some work in um, the Midwest, even with these soy, mono, soy uh, soybean monocultures or uh, corn monocultures, where they planted these strips of prairie, even in between the, the fields. Oh. So, I think, you know, we don't have to change all of agriculture into polyculture, but that's why I end at the end where um, plant diversity is key. And I think it's thinking about it at different scales um, mm -hmm. in terms of how to um, bring AMF diversity on into agriculture soils. Um, what about the practice of like crop rotation? Does that yeah. have, I mean, it's along the same line. I'm sure you get it all the time, but. <laughs> no, I think that's also another, like I just talked about uh, plant yeah. diversity across space and right. crop rotations are uh, plant diversity across time. And the work I've done is kind of a snapshot in time of just, you know, the plants that were there. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential in bringing uh, plant diversity over, uh, over time, but I don't think there's been enough work to actually see how crop rotation specifically affect AMF diversity over time. Okay. Um, so April asks, can you talk more about what advantages uh, lots of AMF diversity provides? Is it better growing plants, um, healthier soil? What, what specifically? Yeah, so I think that's um, what I think I like thinking about is um, in my work, potentially like the next steps, but specifically there's been work in natural systems. So in my work, I always go to the work that people have done in forests or natural systems mm -hmm. about how AMF diversity helps. 
And in those systems, um, increasing the diversity of AMF has a lot of benefits on plant performance in terms of growing, et cetera. And I think there's a lot of potential and some evidence coming in the last years that increasing the AMF diversity could also help crop plants. And I don't think it's uh, too far off to say that what we see in forests in terms of AMF diversity and helping those plants, we can take some of that information and apply it onto um, agricultural systems. Great. Um, so, <laughs> just reading questions. Um, are there, um, so Kabir, I think, mentioned that EMF uh, was potentially better at fending off plant pathogens. Is there any applications to agriculture with EMF? Yeah, so um, like Kabir said, EMF is typically found mostly in trees. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, I, I've been really curious, like how, how many EMF you might find in agriculture. And I think some of those uh, things might come from like trees that get planted, but I don't think there's enough work on how EMF are in agriculture systems and maybe looking at some of the agroforests. So like um, when you have systems like coffee that gets grown amongst mm, different trees, yeah. there might be something, but that's, I think that's a huge question about what <laughs> role EMF play in agriculture. Yeah. Um, and then Deb asks, uh, are there multiple AMF species per plant um, is AMF diversity restricted per plant species? So is a crop like, yeah, hey, yeah. You know, lots of different. Yeah, and maybe I didn't, I feel like I didn't explain this as well. So uh, thanks for the question, Deb. So I think that's part of the mechanism that's happening in that different plants might attract different types of sp species of AMF. And so if you have just one type of plant growing, they might just attract uh, the similar type of AMF species. And so then that over time, if you just keep growing the same uh, plant, then you'll just end up growing, um, fostering a very like homogeneous, really uh, not diverse uh, community of AMF. Mm -hmm. And there has been research showing that as a consequence, a consequence like you might end up with AMF that are parasitic in the oh. sense that you have all these, um, uh, a very less diverse AMF that's been selected by one plant. And then those AMF get smart and they're, uh, because they've been, um, they've been there for a while, then they start um, being parasitic or it's it's um, thought to be that way. But in contrast, if different plants will select for different types of AMF or it's thought that might be happening. And I think that's part of the, why the reason why we're seeing more AMF diversity on polycultures through that uh, mechanism. So thanks Deb for that question. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for, for being here. This is fascinating. I think I'd never thought really about like agriculture and fungi side by side until like we started talking to you and, um, but yeah, thanks so much. And, um, yeah, and we're going to bring on Marcos next. I right, Thanks. Bye. Hey, Marcos, you are on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the invite. Um, so today I'm, I'm, tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about my, my work at the University of Florida, uh, where I uh, look at the role of certain birds in Patagonia uh, on the dispersal of uh, mycorrhizal fungi and particularly truffles. So uh, Kabir already did a really great job uh, explaining what ectomycorrhiza are um, and how they, they, they help uh, trees to get some nutrients in exchange of carbon from the, from the trees uh, and how these uh, fungi are really important in forest, in forest ecosystems. Uh, what I would like to, to point out in this presentation is the fact that most of the, the information and most of the knowledge that we have about ectomycorrhizal fungi and plants came from northern temperate zones. So when we see most of the things that we know about ectomycorrhizae came from North America and Europe primarily. And if we go back in time around like 200 million years ago, uh, both uh, North America and Europe uh, 
were part of this big continent called Laurasia. So they have like this uh, common evolutionary history. So tonight I'm going to be talking about fungi from a different part of the world. Um, I'm going to be focusing on Gondwana, which was this uh, ancient uh, continent that was made out of uh, South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australasia. So for my work, I, 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 I went to the, to the temperate forest in Southern South America. And these forests, uh, although are, are not very big and widely distributed, they have high rates of endemism. And they are also increasingly endangered. And one particular thing is like they are dominated by notification trees. Uh, this family of, of trees are also known as a uh, southern beech. And as you can see in this map, they are distributed uh, in southern South America, as well as uh, Australasia, Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and some other islands. You can see in red the current distribution. And in the past, they even uh, covered some parts of Antarctica. Uh, the notophagaceae trees, the notophagaceae family, they, they are characterized by forming ectomycorrhizal associations with fungi. And as I mentioned, they are native to the southern hemisphere. We only find them in these, in these places. And to give you an idea how they look like, uh, we can see uh, some evergreen forests like this one on the left. Um, in some other cases, there are some deciduous forests that means that they, the, the trees would lose their leaves during the winter time. So we can see uh, both of these uh, type of forests, um, and both of them are uh, dominated by notophagaceae trees. By notophagaceae trees. Uh, of course, there, there's some work that has been uh, done on the ectomycorrhizal communities of this forest. Uh, some of the things that we know, they're probably very different to, to the forests here in North, in North America, is that these forests are dominated uh, by Cortinarius. The, the, this genus Cortinarius, we can see in this picture, all these different mushrooms belong to the same genus. So there's a few lineages that are highly diverse in these forests. Uh, there are also some other fungi that are uh, very particular and probably you, you, you will not see in here in California. There are some uh, unique lineages that are called like temperate gondwana, have to have like a temperate gondwana origin. This is the case of fungi like Australopaxillus, Discolia, and this uh, Satiloma, Halingia, and things that we only find in association with this notophagaceae forest. And in this forest, we, we also find a, a very high diversity of truffles. Uh, and what I mean by truffle are these uh, fungi that, that make breeding bodies. They are totally closed. They, they, unlike a mushroom, they don't open up and they remain closed when they are mature. So if we think about truffles and how like uh, different fungi produce different uh, shapes of fruiting bodies. Uh, we could think the impacts that these have in the in the dispersal spores. We know that fruiting bodies, the main purpose is to to produce spores, and these spores uh, are gonna germinate and generate a new individual of this fungus. So if we look at a mushroom with gills or pores. Uh, these, these uh, mushrooms are going to uh, disperse their spores by wind. They're going to shoot the, the spores into the air. And later on, these spores are going to be dispersed by wind. However, there's some other uh, free bodies that are not mushrooms, like this one here, these two on the left, that they, they produce enclosed free bodies. So they, they are not able to shoot the spores into the air. Um, so the wind doesn't play a role dispersing those spores. So there's some 
that grow uh, above ground and some others here that are like truffles uh, are totally closed, but they also fruit below ground. So we could ask if, like, if they are uh, closed and they, they are not shooting the spores into the air, how do they get the spore, the spore dispersed? So in the case of, uh, particularly in the case of truffle dispersal, uh, we know for a lot of work that has been done in the Northern Hemisphere and Australia, we know that mammal mycophagy, uh, that is the consumption of fungi by animals, uh, play a very important role. And we know that there are some animals that they, they have, they have a, a, this very good sense of smell, and so they are able to find the truffles and they dig them up and they eat them and then they deposit the spores elsewhere and in the other hand truffles make themselves conspicuous and they to, to by giving off others so that way they they attract their their dispersers they make these very strong others so the animals can find them and probably we all know and we are all are familiar with like the, the highly priced truffles, they're basically the same thing, are um, below ground fungi that they have like very strong odors. And that's why they're like a highly priced ingredients for gourmet cuisine. So if we go to the forest and we are, and we try to find and look for truffles, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, we, we will see that there are some very common yeah, truffle eaters, and in this is the case, uh, a squirrel. If we if we go to, to to a forest here, we can follow the squirrels and some other mammals, and they will probably be looking for truffles. Uh, this is not the case um, of the Patagonian forests that are dominated by Notophagy. And what we have noticed is that in Patagonia, some truffles uh, seem to be using different cues, and they some of them are using visual cues. So in this picture on, on the top, we can see that this, uh, there's a truffle, a white truffle. It's called Cystangi notophagi, but it's intermixed with some berries, some native berries that grow alongside. And here on the bottom part of the picture, we can see a similar example where this truffle, Halingia, they are like this one over here, uh, are intermixed with purple berries from the same area. And we can also see some examples with some truffles that look very similar to, to native seeds. So we can think a, a, little bit, a little bit about like how these truffles are being dispersed. It, we have also noticed that uh, we, have, we have found like these, these truffles and these uh, like sequestrate fungi like this one. It, with certain marks and peck marks particularly, which suggests that these uh, fungi were probably being eaten by birds. And if we think about birds, uh, we know that uh, birds are generally known to, to play a very important role as seed dispersers. And we know they eat a lot of different fruits and they play, they, they disperse seeds by doing that. But there is not really a lot of work that has been done looking at the role of birds dispersing fungal spores. So uh, during my, my work, I, I focus on, on two birds native to, to Patagonia. Uh, they are very common birds and they are ground foragers. Uh, these are like the, the, the chucao tapaculo, the top picture, and the black trout wet wet here at the bottom. Right, and um, as I mentioned, they are ground foragers. So there's a, a quick video. Uh, this is the the chucao tapaculo uh, foraging on the on the ground. And um, on the right, we can see other bird, uh, the the wet wet, which is also foraging on the ground and scratching the the leaf litter. So for, for this work, uh, we went to, to southern, southern Chile particularly, and we uh, 
collect and did field work in around in this area spanning over uh, seven seven hundred kilometers. Uh, this is to give you an idea of, of the importance of these interactions. Uh, here on the left, on the left uh, graph, uh, map, you can see the, the distribution of Notophagaceae not forest in Southern South America. And in the, cent in the central map, we can see the distribution of the Chukawa Tapopulo. And on the right, we can see the distribution of um, the wet wet. So wh what we can see here is there's like a big overlap uh, among these three elements, the, the forest and the two birds. So to study this interaction, I, I went to the field and collect uh, fecal, fecal material from, from the birds. And once I collected this, uh, this feces, I used uh, DNA sequencing to identify the, the fungi that were present in the, um, in the feces. And I also use microscopy to look at the, the feces and uh, see if I could find any spores. So when we when we look at the, the DNA sequencing data, uh, one thing that is, is, is very interesting is that uh, when we look at the, the fungal composite, the, the, the composition of the fungal communities from the, the fecal sample, they tend to be very different to the fungal communities that are in the surrounding soils, which means that whatever the birds are moving is very different to what is in the surrounding soils. And we, we are also able to, to see a very clear uh, geographical pattern. So you can see here in the map, uh, uh, in reds are like the, the sites are like in the northern part and in blues are the, the sites are in the southern part of the, the distribution. And we can see something very similar in the case of the fungal communities. And if we look at this uh, forest, makes sense because like the um, this not the face forest can be very diverse and very different so these are like in the, in the south and just to give you an idea how how these forests look like and with the dna sequencing data we we are also able to to uh, detect a very wide diversity of truffles are, that were being consumed by the birds so here um, on the bottom we can see that all these names correspond to different species of truffles that were being consumed by both the Chukao Papulo and the black throat wet wet. Um, and just to, to give you an idea of how these uh, fungi look like, uh, here are some of the, the most commonly consumed truffles. Uh, here, there's this one here, there's like the, the bee, there's a uh, Hysrangium, the scolia, and there's some very different uh, truffles that are being consumed by the by the birds. And we are also by looking at the and by examining the um, the fecal samples under under the microscope, we were able to match both the DNA sequencing data with uh, the identification of the fungal spores. So we can we can confirm that. Uh, these birds are actively consuming this, um, these truffles and also dispersing the spores. Uh, we, we also had the, the chance to make some direct observations of this interaction. So we can see this little bird, this chukao, just eating like a tiny truffle. And when we look at it like, closer, we realize that what's this uh, really nice specimen of Cystangium uh, notophagi, which is a very common truffle found in this notophagaceae forest. So as I mentioned, we were able to see by DNA sequencing that these birds are consuming a very wide diversity of truffles. And we were also able to uh, see spores from those same truffles in the feces. So what we wanted to do ne next was Test if the um, test whether these spores remain viable after they have like passed the digestive system of the birds, and if they are viable, they should be able to germinate and 
uh, colonize uh, a tree root afterwards. So to test these, we, we, we take, um, we use this uh, viability test uh, by using a, a, a specific kind of a microscopy It's called epifluorescent microscopy, where we stain the, um, the spores and see how they react to the stain. So in this case, we can see here that there are some spores that they, they, they fluoresce in red and there are some others that don't. So what this uh, stain does is it penetrates only on the, um, the spores that are damaged. So that means that those cells are, are dead. So we can see here in this picture here, in bright field, uh, we can see these uh, different spores. But when we look at them under fluorescent microscopy, we'll see that the stain is going to be able to penetrate some of the spores and some others it won't. So that means that there are some, some spores that are dead, but on the other hand, there's some other spores that remain viable and they, they remain alive and they will potentially germinate. Uh, some other uh, uh, very interesting things that we, we, we were able to see is that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, what we have learned about mammal mycophagy is that uh, mammals tend to rely on their, their sense of smell to find uh, the truffles. And in the case of birds, it might be, it might be slightly different because like, birds tend to be more visual foragers. And we, we found that uh, in this, there's like this very interesting case of some truffles that they are able to reflect UV light. And there's, there's some studies that have shown that there's many birds that are able to see in this UV spectrum. So probably uh, these truffles, they look very different, different from, the, from the bird's perspective. And we also uh, accidentally discovered uh, bird mycophagy on other taxa. And there's some other, other birds uh, besides the, the ones I show you that seems to also be eating uh, quite a lot of truffles, but which, which would suggest that this uh, bird mycophagy might be way more common than, than previously thought. And um, just like the, the, the conclusions of this study was well, both uh, chukaos and wetwets eat a wide diversity of truffle fungi, uh, which has not never been uh, reported before. And these interactions, they are very common and widespread in this uh, forest, in this very understudied uh, forest. But we can, if we just look closer, we can see these really cryptic interactions. And also, it's important to know that almost half of the spores remain by appear to be viable after they have been eaten by the birds and these birds are dispersing uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi and spores therefore by doing that they are influen also influencing the fungal communities in this forest and with that i'll be happy to take any questions hi marcos this this was so cool um uh, yeah, it's it's so amazing how it, you know you've kind of pinpointed these truffles, uh, and like evolving mm -hmm. to look like fruits almost, and like yeah, just completely different. Um, yeah, yeah, just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I have to say, um, as soon as you mentioned birds eating truffles, I really wanted to see or ask if you had seen a bird with a truffle in its mouth. So thank you for putting in that <laughs> yeah. little picture of the bird, like with this little baby truffle. Um, have you seen any uh, bird truffle, birds carrying truffles that are like too big for them? Or, or was that the, the primary um, observation? <laughs> I, am, I'm, I mean, like that, that was like one of the primary observations, but uh, they usually, if they are too big, they just like take a piece. Ah, yeah, um, a little like a little so, like, nibble of it. <laughs> yeah, so like there's, there's also that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so delightful. I love it. Um, 
So uh, your experiences in the field sound uh, quite amazing. And uh, we're very curious, how do you end up finding the bird feces to sample? Like, how do you go track those down? <laughs> um, what's it like being in the field? Uh, yeah, that, that's probably like the most challenging part, uh, collect the, the, the feces. And um, we basically took like two different approaches. One was a, a catch the bird and just like they put them in a in a cloth bag and they they poop immediately. So you just like <laughs> take the take the the, the, feces, the feces and then release the bird. Yeah. And and the other part the the, the other um, approach was just chasing around the birds until they <laughs> they defecate so yeah. so that that part was very very intense because you have to just wait and chase birds all day <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i imagine that <laughs> that can get old very quickly <laughs> especially in a forest yeah. but um yeah thank you thank you for uh indulging my uh my questions but um uh, can you, uh, uh, do we know if truffles are the only species so far uh, of of any kind of fungi that are consumed by birds and dispersed by birds? Um, or do we know of other, other fungi species as well? Yeah, there, there's definitely some other um, species and they they certainly don't, don't only eat uh, truffles. Uh, the, the importance of like birds eating truffles is like, uh, for example, mushrooms, they can disperse this, their spores in very different ways. They, they right. can shoot the spores into the air and the wind take those, those spores to a new place. Uh, in the case of truffles, they cannot do that because like they, like once the, the truffle mature, the, the truffle remains in the same place mm -hmm. unless someone takes them out of that place and move them around. So right. that's why we, we focus on, on truffles. Yeah, yeah, that completely makes sense. Um, and Ch Channel asks, uh, do we know what causes the truffles to emit like the UV light spectrum wa waves, I, I guess? Um, you know, what causes them to do that? Uh, no, I, well, I, actually that that has been like a very accidental found that, uh, we're just trying. We, we're just trying to think how, like truffles might look, from the bird perspective. And in some point, I I, I was advised by a, an ornithologist. It was like this person mentioned, "Oh yeah, but birds, uh, they can see in UV in, in the UV spectrum." So I just like went to the field with a UV lamp, like a flash, uh, like a flashlight lamp, and just start looking at. Uh, truffles, different truffles under the UV light. Um, yes, yeah, some of them reflect the UV light, but not all of them. But they, we definitely need to look further and that would be like a really interesting question to investigate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess reflect reflect the waves and not emit mm -hmm. them, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is what you're saying? Like you yeah. shine yeah. a flashlight and mm -hmm. they... Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And... Um... Let's see. Uh, Deb asks, was there any evidence of mammalian foraging or scavenging on these same bird eaten truffles? Um, and, you know, are, are these truffles in any way similar to the ones that <laughs> we as human like, the expensive ones? Uh, no, they're, they're like, uh, for, for the first question, uh, there's not a uh, very clear evidence of mammalian forage, uh, foraging in that area. There's definitely mammals there, uh, but the diversity of mammals is it's not as high as what you would see in, in northern forest. Uh, so, and if you go to the, this forest, uh, the main ground foragers in this forest tend to be these two birds. They're, they're gotcha. very charismatic birds. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, in the case of if they are similar to the very expensive ones, uh, they are not, they, 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 
belong to different lineages and different totally different groups of fungi. And just truffle, when, when we talk about truffle, we, we are referring just to uh, a morphological trait. And so when we see, like when we talk about mushroom, it's basically a cap when it's, when a, with stipe and it might have like gills or pores, but we all mm -hmm. have like the general idea of like how a mushroom look like. It, in the case of truffle, like truffle can be like any any fungi, any fruiting body that uh, when it's mature, remain close and tend to grow and fruit below ground. So there's many, many species that they, they do that. And there's some, some hypotheses why they, they do that. Uh, there's some evidence that and, and some studies that suggest that uh, be, by fruiting below ground really helps the, the, the the freeing bodies to uh, not lose that much water. So it's like oh. very advantage in like in places that are like seasonally dry and also uh, protect them like for like frost. Mm -hmm. So because like, if there's a frost, all the all the mushrooms are gonna get frozen and are gonna like die immediately. Yeah. But if the truffle is like well protected below ground, it's just gonna do fine. And um, and like that that's that's a, like the main definition I would say of a truffle. It's just close and fruits below ground. And the very expensive ones, they do the same thing. And they are yes. also fruit below ground and and they're like sort of like close. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure this force. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense having a uh, yeah, just the different niches that they adapt mm -hmm. to, like truffle mm -hmm. versus mushrooms broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's um, really interesting. I, I did not know that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, thank you so much, Marcos, for sharing your research. And and yeah, this was such a great, such a great talk. Um, and I believe I will bring Christina up for our final goodbyes, but it was so great to have you on. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah. Hi. Hi, Christina. Hey. Uh, um, thank you so much to our guests tonight, Kabir and Ide and Marcos. Um, we learned so much. Um, I hope all of you did too. Um, yeah. All right. I got some news. Yes. Got some <laughs> real exciting news. Um, starting March 3rd, night school will be coming, coming to you on the first and third weeks of every month. Um, so catch us twice a month. Yeah. Um, yay. And our March 3rd night school will be um, uh, featuring women in science. So um, stay tuned. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, and you can stay tuned by subscribing to our YouTube channel. So you get notification when we come back. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, like the Academy's Facebook page. And um, yeah, and if you want to share this program with your loved ones and your loved ones who love fungi or fungi, whatever they want to say, um, the recordings <laughs> so you get with confidence. Um, the recordings will stay on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can send them there whenever you want. Um, it's been a pleasure to be back and a pleasure to host with you, Aria. Oh, likewise. And, <laughs> and we'll see you all next month. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Bye.